So the Buddha said, you attach yourself to an educated man and learn from him. Ken and I used to hike here at Radnor and we'd take Gainier Ridge. <laughs> he, he, would be, he would be teaching all the way up, just talk, 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 talk. And I'd be listening all the way up as he would talk, 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 talk. And we'd get to the top of the ridge and look out and he'd still be teaching. When people criticize religion, they're throwing ritual, ceremony, myth, they're throwing everything into the meaning of religion. But I really found out what religion meant when I went to Thailand. The Buddhists taught me. And what they would say is, Tuk Sasana Di Muen Gwen. And that translates out that all religions are equally good. We have got to see that the core is the only thing that God is interested in. In the center of your heart, who are you? Because we're trying to talk about a God who cannot be understood. His depth is far beyond our minds to comprehend. So God has given us just one little word, grace, and it's beautiful. There's nothing you can say against that except I don't believe it. But if you believe it, then you know the, full, the fullness of the heart and character of God. Sometimes he lets us die. Sometimes he heals. But it's his, it's his to do as he pleases. It's his love. It's his treasure. And hence, we understand in Jesus Christ. This world is not our home. We don't live for this world. You seek your mind on things that are above. To leave this world is not to leave home, but it's to get to go home. Why am I crying? <laughs> Why am I crying? <laughs> We're getting to go home. The guy just had a limitless supply of energy. And then when he had his heart attack and got sick, the decline just went so fast. Ken, what you've got is congestive heart failure. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that you're, because of some previous heart attacks, the muscle, the squeeze of your heart is weaker than it should be. I think ultimately we cannot cure this. In other words, it is ultimately a fatal condition. But here in nature, in the middle of Nashville, this is the place where he really untied a lot of the knots in my brain. Meanwhile, we have your life, and uh, you told me you want to make a journey back to the places where you've ministered and as your physician and as your friend. My goal would be f to get you back there, to be able to make that. and. This is likely to be kind of a last summit. Trying to reconcile this idea of God as love, and yet this story that Jesus has to save us from God. And I couldn't reconcile that with things that I had read in the Bible and the different ways that people inside the Christian church act toward certain people or to certain things. And what really strikes me is his ability to allow the person that he's teaching to discover the knots in their mind. And he allows them to untie those knots. Ken never gave an answer to me. He always seemed to just ask me another question that was introspective and caused me to go in deeper and search for what that answer should be. Can any man withstand the love of God for eternity? No way. But I'll tell you what is really absurd is to think that God's love and mercy and compassion extending to him stops the moment he dies. His love never stops. It continues on the same. One second into the next world. 
God's love is just as great and still working on how he can bring you closer to him. Pagan or whatever, he's God's child. I've got to go see him in Thailand. I need to see what this country is that changed him so much. I need to meet these people who have obviously shaped the way this man thinks and believes and moves and acts. This Westerner who became an Easterner. Uh, I, I want to take this journey. I want to find out who this guy really is. As soon as they landed in Thailand, he was not in a good place. Immediately hospitalized. Then, like a day and a half before we're before we're gonna leave, we get the message that he uh, needs to go to Singapore. That Dr. Tioni needs to look at him. Got a message from Ken and Sandra at five o'clock this morning. They've already flown at this point. They've flown to Singapore. I don't know how to feel. I'm I'm excited to finally get to take the steps that he's taken and kind of journey through his life, if you will, through his pages and his letters and through the actual landscaping. But it's also scary because I don't know what I'm walking into. I don't know if we're going to see Ken again or not. You know, once you get the message, how beautiful it is. If people can understand it, they'll take it. The only thing is you got to get rid of the baggage. Yeah, that cultural baggage. Yeah, man. But the love of God can take care of culture. People don't stop to think, how many cultures does God take care of? Bangkok, waiting on our driver. He's gonna take us around today to see some of the sights. And what I'm looking most forward to is kind of trying to put a physical location along with the, the mindset of the, of the Thai people, the mindset of the Buddhist people. And I'm trying to understand how Ken lived in this place where he couldn't relate to the Thai and couldn't relate to the Western church person. When my wife and I went to Asia in 58, I had four little babies, three and under, whenever we started. I realized that uh, I was taking them into a part of the world where I might lose all of them. So that was a very difficult decision uh, as I contemplated more and more about going. Why would a man move to Thailand with his family? Why would a man want to move back to Thailand at the end of his life? I don't know if you know the story or not. Somebody handed me a letter and said, Dear Ken, there are in Asia some 500 million people in China, some 400 million people in India, not counting the millions of people of Burma and Laos and Cambodia, in Vietnam, Indonesia, all the thousands of surrounding islands, all together better than a billion people, and only one preacher from our denomination among them. Won't you come and go with me to Thailand? Man, I mean, a billion people crushed my shoulders. I mean, I, I could barely preach this sermon that night. I got through, I handed it to her, she read it, 
We got in the car and we headed home. I didn't say anything to her. She hadn't said anything to me. She said, we must go. A little over two weeks, sold the whole thing. Dear Uncle Thurl and Aunt Gladys, Ruth and I have made a decision after much praying and studying to go to Bangkok, Thailand. We believe Bangkok provides a wonderful opportunity to plant the seed of the kingdom in the dying world. Why Thailand? She is pro-Western. Bangkok is crying for English teachers. Education there is compulsory. The King James Version can be used as a text in schools for teaching English. Now is the time, if ever, to take the gospel to them. The Thais are educated and they will teach their own people. If I were to assume what made Thailand home for Ken, it was those experiences. I think Ken was forced to question how he understood God because he was in the midst of a people that did not understand what he was explaining. And I think that in that forced environment to have to learn to view things from another angle and to trust that he was going to find the same answer, but not knowing. I think those are the places where you grow up. And when you grow up in that environment, that becomes your home. It was about 1974, 75. He was uh, visiting Belmont, my first husband and I, and we were over there having supper. Charlotte was saying, well, you know, there's a missionary couple staying upstairs. And uh, we went on with our conversation, and they came in, stopped, knocked on the door, and came into Charlotte and Bob's apartment, and that's when I first met them. I think on that same trip, he spoke at the church, so, you know, I was very impressed by this sermon. And being uh, really involved, you know, having had this call on my heart about missions for so many years, I, uh, you know, I was immediately taken with the fact that they were missionaries. The Spirit of the Lord is not limited to one people or to one belief. Muslims, Buddhists, whatever. Everybody is made in God's image. And the breath of God is in every man. And the life and the Spirit of God is in every man. So that when I face a person, the thing that's going to demonstrate what is true and what is not true is the love and the truth that he knows. So you never say anything to a man but what is true to him. It was part of my goal to give my children a view of the world that was beyond the borders of the southeastern part of the United States. I always made an effort to have people like Ken and Ruth in the house. Let them know there was to not be so provincial and parochial that they was, there was a world beyond and they, you know, everybody was different and there were different ways of doing things. And, uh, so that's really how I got to know the right outs. Science calls spirit into question. So I grew up with an expectation, with an assumption that behind and beyond all the physical was the spiritual and the immaterial and, and, and the divine, was God. Mm -hmm. So then I figured out um, through a series of unfortunate events uh, that there was no God and there was no spirit and all there is is all there is. There's atoms and energy. That's it. And my story is one of God breaking that assumption by moving in my life. Um, and I've responded to God's invitation to walk with Him in my own life. Now, let's talk about Christ for a second. On the one hand, you have Jesus and He comes. I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. Mm -hmm. And I have an incredible heart for finding those people who, like me, are sick and broken. That, that's where I find God leading me, is those people who are hurt, who are wounded and limping, and walking with them. And I'm very comfortable with that part mm -hmm. of the life and message of Jesus. But you're a church planter, 
and an evangelist. And Jesus also said, Go ye therefore. And where I have trouble and where it comes apart with me is going to a person who is happy as they are, be it an atheist, a Buddhist, a Muslim, who's living a good life and telling them that my understanding of God and my relationship with Christ should be important to them. I don't know how to, in my own life, make that leap. Even though Jesus does so much for me, even though I've experienced such healing and such restoration and such growth through Christ and through His church, I don't know how to go ye therefore. We went to the University of Singapore to study Mandarin. While there, I received a telegram from a schoolmate. He said, Ken, an outstanding opportunity. In the University of uh, Beijing, the medical department, they have a heart surgery team of 50 men and women. If you'd like to teach them English, let me know. So it's a long, beautiful story, but uh, in a few weeks, I found myself teaching them. I said, uh, I know it's difficult to learn a language. You can get your tongue set around. You always say something funny. I said, you're all mature, accomplished teachers, the best that China has. Hey, we're family here. We can laugh and we can carry on and, and enjoy our mistakes. So I said, you want to ask me any kind of question? I don't care what it is. At any time, you want to know about my life, what I've done, what it's like wherever I've lived in America. I said, just go ahead and ask. I says, we'll do that to, to create a, a real understanding among us. As we went along after several weeks, then they said to me one day, they said, uh, how are you gonna prove God? And so I said, well, you don't prove God, you know God. Things in the physical dimension you prove with physical tools, like chemistry or measurements or weights. Uh, I said, but things of the spirit, God's spirit bears witness with your spirit that is true. They just stared at me. They said, we don't understand what you mean. I said, all right, you tell me. Should you lie, steal, cheat, kill, murder me? I went around the class. Each one said no, no. And then I came back and I said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, we're sure. They all said they were sure. So I said, prove it. Silence. I said, you don't prove it, you know it. I said, you reached down the very core of your being into your heart and you spoke a truth that you know you know. I asked the children and the children answer exactly the way you did. You're not showing anything brilliant. You're speaking a truth that people know and even children know. So whoever our maker is has written that upon the human heart. I said, if you love like this, I didn't say who that was or anything about it. I just went like that. If you love like this, so that your life, my life is yours. I live for you, I'll die for you. You can kill me, you can eat me, whatever. I came to give you life and life abundant to give you the greatest enjoyment of life that can possibly be had. I said, if I love you like that, would I lie, steal, kill, and cheat you? And they said, no. So we went all the way around the class. They all said the same. And I said, are you sure? And they said, yes, we're sure. And then I said, you don't have to prove it. You just know it. When someone tells me that God is love, and they mean that kind of love, I said, I know they're telling me the truth. And I said, so I believe that God is love. I said, let me ask you a question. If the whole world loved like that, what kind of a world would it be? I couldn't get them quiet. They talked for half an hour. When they got through, their conclusion was, it'd be a great world. To the man, they all said, this would be a great world. 
I said, so okay. I said, so now this establishes our relationship with one another. This is our friendship. This is how I'm to live for you. I'm to live in, for you in such a way that I'll die for you. And when we all live that way, preferring one another in love, I said, hey, we got a great world. I think that's what I respect most about him, was his willingness and his trust to give me what I needed and let me come to the conclusions I needed to come to out of that, trusting that the truth would in fact be what I arrive at. Gao? Gao. 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 Yes. I am I am Thai. <laughs> what the gal? That's tough. One of the things that I find, one of the things that Ken and I get get along with so well on is just our desire to uh, speak with any single human being on the planet, and. Um, the hardest part for me to be in another country is that I don't speak the language. Just give my mom a big hug, you know, even they can't communicate in, and my mom don't speak English, and, uh, but he would just, you know, make her feel very comfortable, and uh, they just uh, communicate by gesture, hand gesture, yeah. And that's how they have uh, built relationship along the way, yeah. So I, I think this is a very special relationship that we have, my family, with Ken right up. I'm always looking for any opportunity to just make somebody smile, make somebody have a better day. Um, I just want people to enjoy life and I want them to try to find joy in anything and everything. I can't resist, I'm gonna to have to go over there and make a fool out of myself. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. Oh my goodness. I'm painfully aware of how out of shape I am right now. So did you have that sort of a jovial, joking relationship with him from the start? There wasn't any other type of relationship that Ken had, right? That's, uh, that kind of uh, epitomizes who he is, right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's Ken to a T. He's full of energy, you know, and he really speaks with that kind of conviction and vigor, yeah. So it's like, you have to listen, you know. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't come with us a set of uh, dogmas or, or a set of teachings that he will want you to sign off and say you've got to repeat and, and uh, present it as it has been written. I think he comes with this sense of freedom. The thing about him is that he is uh, not judgmental, I feel. Uh, mm. And uh, because of the way that he encourages me, even though I'm not there yet, I could do likewise to those people who are younger than me and I can also be very gracious and kind to them as well because I've gone through that tough journey. So with his help, I know that by uh, doing that to the younger generation, I know that they will be able to go far as well. Well, the arc of the Bible, and I think that's another problem, is that people don't really delve into biblical scholarship. They don't really read the entire Bible. Mm -hmm. If you read the arc of this wonderful biblical story from beginning to end, it's really all about how God is so loving and so compassionate. And all God wants to do is to be in community 
with all of us, exactly. his creation. And if that is the truth, then all of these rules and these laws that continue to inhibit and prevent and boundary us away from that community and that love, that is not part of God's design for his beloved kingdom. Exactly. Right. Because law is divisive. Yeah. Anytime you have an argument or a fight, it's law. Right. Not love. Right. Not grace. Grace never created a hell. That's right. And so we got much to change. So, you know, when I told you the Lord didn't touch polygamy, he didn't say anything about polygamy. Mm -hmm. He didn't say anything about homosexuality. He didn't say anything about slavery. Well, imagine the toleration point. Mm. That's the Lord's toleration. That can wait. That's the way he felt about it. Yeah. This is enough. This is enough. He wanted to get the love. If if, can I quote you? Right. You betcha. <laughs> God wants mercy. Not, not sacrifice. Where does it say that God ever was going to judge men by the law? In Genesis 3, in the morning, hey, everything's fine. No condemnation. Right. Everybody's happy. But when God comes back, there's a condemnation. God's angry. God's vengeful. God's wrathful. Well, where did that come from? It was their perception, wasn't it? Their perception. Now their belief is that God is angry. Hmm. But God's not angry. Why should he be angry? Does he know what's going to happen? Yeah. Before he created man, does he know that man's going to sin? Hmm. Does he know that man cannot live perfectly? He knows that. He knows man cannot love perfectly. He cannot live up to the image that he has given him. God's always going to save the world through his love. If you're under law, he says, it's like a veil. You cannot see the grace of God. Why? Because law condemns. Mm. It's a law of condemnation. So you have no business going out and condemning people. Why do you condemn them? Because you know God judges the world through the cross, mm. through Jesus Christ. He doesn't judge the world through law. So why do you? So Jesus said, you judge not. What do you think of these, you know, those street preacher guys that just get out there and yell at everybody and, you know. All they know is law. They're teaching <laughs> law. Yeah. It's condemnation. And so people turn away. So they said, you forget your God yeah. because their God is a God of condemnation. That's what I'm saying about even evangelical Christianity. The doctrine of hell is the strongest, most evil indictment against a person that can be done. To damn the majority of the people to a fiery hell for eternity, but that doesn't harmonize with love. When he created man in his image, his image is love, and love is under life. There's no power, no power. Colossians 1, far above all principalities and powers, both in heaven and on earth, all things are subject to him. Mm. And Paul comes down and says, that he might reconcile all things unto him. But then when it says that, they don't want to take it. But what about the law? There's got to be justice. Here is the justice of God. It's love. Hmm. Nice, huh? Yeah. Did you... Uh, <clears throat> I may be reading into this, so this might be completely wrong. Feel free to tell me that I'm way off base. Uh, did you go through a period of time where you struggled with with your faith and with the conservative side of things versus law and grace and all of that? Um, I'm a stickler for rules. Yeah. And yeah, and I am a highly analytical person. And I believe that it is only fair if punishment is being meted out for, if you do something wrong, right? It's only fair. So 
And it's not fair if somebody does something wrong and you know the person gets away with it and you think that God loves everybody equal, right? But it's um it's also coming to terms with my own shortcomings. That God loves me despite. And um but in order to fulfill the requirements of law, God has to send Christ to die for us so that we could actually be free to be the person that He wants us to be. For Him to come to us and, and, and talk about grace and love um, was more than just the basic grace and love that uh, we would understand from what we would call born-again evangelical Christian. Um, in fact, I, he's so taken up with the idea that uh, our God is a loving God that at this moment in time or for some time now, uh, he's bordering on, on this thought. I don't know whether he's got it all firmed up, but he's like basically saying, it's difficult for you to imagine that if we have such a loving God that he in the end will really have hell to eternally punish everyone that don't come to who don't recognize him in their life. I I still hold to the position that well if you do not acknowledge the presence of God, you are already in hell. You know, but for him to come to that conclusion really uh and I'm I'm now at in life at a position where you know, you each, we all each can come to their, our own conclusion of uh, where God will finally lead us. But to have him come to that conclusion from a background of, um, of a Church of Christ minister, I think one thing is very clear. He's so on the idea. God is love. And the only message that really matters is God is love. Homer, the Indian philosophies, the Buddha, the Chinese, they're all the ones that created the idea of hell and burning brimstone and so forth long before Jesus was ever shown up in this world. They were teaching it. So when Jesus said what he said, it wasn't him talking. He's quoting what they all believe. That's what the Pharisees taught. So he's just taking their belief and contrasting it with his mercy and grace. That takes care of that. We can almost see Jesus in him because he was really the personification of love. I've always understood that in the later years of John, the disciple, when he couldn't say or teach very much, the only thing he would write is love. And that was the message that we get from Ken.
with me the number one thing. Number one. And when I leave someone, what I want to be sure that I leave him with is that he sees that the heart and the character of God is beautiful. It is love. It is wisdom. It's forgiveness. It's compassion. And I tell him this right straight up front. And I say, that is the heart of God. Our pursuit is for him. And that is the truth that we're talking about. So if I say anything to you that's not true to you, forget it. It's not important. Mm -hmm. And I mean that. Mm -hmm. I mean that today. Love is giving. Love is thankful. Mm -hmm. Love is grateful. And so I'm trying to bring you to an understanding of your maker so that you can begin to thank him and be grateful to him. Because the world is not doing that. And so the Buddhists have no God. The Hindu have their Brahma and all those other gods. But they can't come to them with that compassion that uh, Jesus has shown. And I'll show my cards a little bit here. Um, and in my period of unbelief, um, it began with, well, maybe I have the wrong God. And I studied um, Hinduism and Buddhism. And I actually found the Brahmin concept to be quite beautiful. Mm. Um, and to some degree, that still influences how I conceive of the Father. Um, well, we easily quote the Stoics when we say, in him we move and breathe right. and have our very being. When we go into that kind of philosophy, it's not necessary. Nobody knows what's... After the life, when you come to death, nobody knows Amen. what's going on. So all conjecture, it, it depends. You are conjecturing from something in this dimension. So hell and the burning fire and the beatings and the whippings and so forth, that is a doctrine of law. Right. Never grace. And so you can't have Jesus teaching it. so competent. He's a great man. Thai Buddhism is even evolving now because when you modernize a country, you industrialize a country, uh, people are now driving cars and owning homes and prosperity is coming in. It's against the very philosophy of Buddhism. You have to understand the religious teachings but then you have to understand the cultural thing, too. If I look at what drove uh, Ken throughout the years, uh, was uh, his determination to understand what it is that we have in common. He hasn't only come to these conclusions through study, but he's come to these conclusions through trial and error. We're in Chiang Mai. The city proper, northern Thailand, about 700 kilometers north of Bangkok. This has been my home since 1962. From the time we moved to Chiang Mai, Dad was doing village work primarily. So uh, we were being homeschooled. Uh, my mother homeschooled four children out of one room. She was juggling that and helping dad on the weekends, we would all go out as a family to these villages that he was working and we would be a part of that. Uh, we didn't have uh, your traditional services like you have in church buildings. We were in uh, huts going house to house. We had our baptisms in either a stream or near a waterfall. We haven't started an institution. We're not closed into a, a building 
with office and so forth and doing all of that. Our, our work ground is the field itself. That was, I think, the key note to it all. So when they're running and playing with us, they're getting to be with foreigners, which is really great. And they're getting to speak English, which is really great. And they're making contacts to the West. My concept of church, my concept of ministry was pretty much a very organic concept growing up. Uh, but later, uh, he established a church in Chiang Mai, the city. Uh, we lived in a teakwood house in the center of the old city. And uh, it was probably a 120-year-old home. The meeting area was underneath the house. So he developed a room. He had a room built underneath the house. And so uh, sometimes when we were in town and we would have services underneath the house, uh, we would have quite a number of people in our compound. So my life growing up around my parents was just, uh, we were surrounded with ministry. Uh, we always welcomed uh, the fact that people were coming and going and it was kind of a grand central station. And uh, on the weekends when he was gone, uh, the four of us would take turns. Uh, one of us per weekend would be allowed to go with him on his motorcycle. Back in those days when the road would run out when you got out of the city, to get into these villages, you could straddle the uh, dividers on the rice paddy. He would even attempt to drive those, uh, those little uh, dividers. It wasn't a road. It was quite narrow. And many times, uh, I, I can remember us slipping off the edge on that thing and our bike going down. And so you would get all wet in those rice fields, brush yourself off, and go, go again. I remember that uh, his study and his determination. It was a very common thing for him to be up at three and four in the morning and, uh, and do his studies and prayer time until daylight. And honestly, I don't, I don't believe the Western church is ready for him yet. I think that they may be in 10 years. His teaching is gonna help change the Western church. I agree. Uh, the, the Asian church has already changed. We're already there. Yeah. Uh, but the Westerner is going to, uh, they're going to gradually come away more and more from the Judeo-Christian thing mm -hmm. uh, and come into a universal gospel of Jesus, something that's relevant to all. I think the desperation of the old theology is that nobody knows the end. Mm -hmm. We're just hoping for the best. And that causes us, as servants of the Lord, to have a tendency to manipulate things and to strike a gospel of fear sure and uh, to me it just uh, you know if if the gospel isn't good news let's don't preach it right and uh, that's why I was saying earlier I, I I've got nothing to do with hell because because God has nothing to do with hell and to me that is the very significance of the power of the gospel message is that it's all good news all we have to do is share what God asks us to share. We don't have to add to that. I've learned from my father and his teachings. I've learned from his example in ministry. I've also learned just as much from my mother. And when I look back on her life, uh, uh, the ensampling there to her children, was that her, her consistency of her life was the ingredient that I'll never forget. My mother was uh, a very amazing woman. She spoke seven languages at the time of her death, but uh, she, she was truly called. She was truly called uh, to the field just as much as my father was. I remember when he would uh, make his fundraising trips to the U.S., uh, we would uh, be left with her, and she was to carry on the ministry and keep everything going and all of the communication from the villages in his absence and sometimes uh, at one time he was gone as long as six months or more and uh, she was fully able to do those things. She was very gifted at covering all of the bases and uh, giving hospitality in every way to the locals as well as the outsiders that would come in. So, And uh, how she was able to homeschool four children in the midst of all of this was really beyond me. But somehow I, my memory was that she was always able to get those things done. I think the joy 
and uh, her her approach to life in general was something that sticks with me, it sticks in my mind to this day. So it was when I was 45 that I actually went over to uh, Hong Kong and worked with a mission there in and out of China. While we were in Hong Kong, uh, I took a team into Thailand. Uh, I was with Asian Outreach and there was an Asian, Asian Outreach missionary stationed in Chiang Mai who knew Norman and had met Ken and Ruth a couple of times. And then we were in Asia when Ruth died. We were in Hong Kong when Ruth died. When I went into, uh, into China and taught at the Be Beijing Medical University, <clears throat> when I came out of there, uh, I noticed on Ruth a lump on her breast. We had no health insurance. I had no health insurance. I'm 65 years old and we didn't have health insurance. Um, so she wouldn't uh, do anything about it. She wouldn't spend the money. She said, no, it's more money than what. But most of all, she didn't want all the attention. She said, so that was back in the day where if you took the chemo or if you didn't take it, it was a 50-50 that you live about the same time. She said, I'd just soon go without it. And so she rode, the, rode it out. And so that was uh, in 82. So she managed to live until uh, 95. A very remarkable woman. So she never went to a doctor. She never took any pills. And her breast was just being eaten away till it became just raw flesh right down to the bone. She said, I've said goodbye to all of my loved ones. I've taken care of my business. And she said, uh, I cannot sleep, the pain is too great. She passed away about eight o'clock. My son, Norman, he is so competent. He's a great man. So he took, he did everything. He saw to the cremation. Uh, so we have her in a, an old famous cemetery. To her dying day, she never doubted her call to Thailand and Southeast Asia. My son, Norman, will always be there. He'll never leave. I thought I'd go and be with him. That's that story. Beautiful woman. I remember praying, John and I praying for Ken, you know, and, and how, you know, how he was going to manage with that Ruth. And I remember uh, John saying, Mom, she was oil for Ken's machine. How is he going to, you know, how is he going to get along without her? So it was kind of ironic uh, as it turned out that I was praying. I was the answer to the prayer I was praying. <laughs> I've always said I got to marry my hero because Ken and Ruth were certainly my mission's heroes for many years. And uh, not many people get to do that. Uh, yeah, I lost my brother, Dan my younger brother, Daniel. He was a single missionary and we were working together in the South 
of Thailand back in 1987. And uh, uh, we lost him. Uh, he was shot in a daylight robbery. Uh, had about 500 baht on his person, a uh, credit card, and a ring on his finger. Back in those days, it was not that unusual in that part of the country that these things would happen. You know, I knew Ken for all these years and never knew mm -hmm. um, how his son passed uh -huh. Uh -huh. until we started making this film. When I went to see Daniel on the island, it's kind of a jungle. There's nothing around, no houses, nothing. You follow a path, you come to a clearing. And in that clearing, you had concrete slabs sitting up this high and quite wide. And on that concrete slab was a piece of uh, the old green plastic. Remember the heavy stuff that you'd have? Really heavy. And he was, that, they took that to put over him to keep the flies and stuff and the birds and everything else off from him. So I pulled it back, and sure enough, there he lay on that slab. So we, uh, we shipped him back to the mainland by helicopter and got him on up to Thailand, and uh, he's buried in Bangkok. The thing that I really remember the most about this experience, and, it's, and particularly because we were close, we were working directly together uh, on a day in and day out basis, was that I kind of just uh, had a dilemma that I lost my heart for the Thai people through this experience. One day, uh, my wife asked me to take her to the market, the open market. She was going to be uh, delivering soon, and we wanted to pick up a few things. And I didn't feel much like uh, uh, visiting with anybody in the marketplace. I was still pretty much to myself. So I let her shop and I spent about a half an hour. So I sat down on a stool. There were two stools in front of an Indian cloth shop. And I sat there and was minding my own business. And it wasn't any time at all that an old uh, Buddhist monk uh, in his 70s probably came and sat down on the stool beside me. He said, I'm sorry to trouble you today. He said, you seem to be wanting to kind of be to yourself. He said, but uh, I've spent my life studying the world of the spirit dimension. He said, I've studied the spirits in the, in the forest, in the jungles. I've studied, uh, I've studied the human spirit in every way that I can. He said, but today I see in you a spirit that demands the highest standard of human living that I've ever encountered. And he said, I just want to ask you, what is it that I'm feeling? What is it that I'm seeing? Well, I had tears rolling down my eyes and I answered him and I told him it was the Holy Spirit of Jesus that he's seen in me, that I'm a disciple, and that I belong to him. And this is the, the, the beauty and the reality to the gospel. And we spoke for quite some time. And at the end of that experience, he walked away, and I've never seen him since. But I know he was changed. But most of all, I know I was changed. And what struck me the most was when people thought they were just going to a funeral to comfort this family. It turned out to me like an evangelistic meeting. And on and on, one after another, they were preaching about God, about Jesus, the love of God. I, th I thought, did I go to a funeral service or evangelistic meeting? No. In fact, at the end of the, servi the service, like five or six young people went out and received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And when I saw that, you know, the power of God's love coupled with even the grieving family, and uh, it was so moved that, you know, I was so touched that that very night I went back to the hotel room I kneeled before God and, and prayed a prayer. I said, God, if you will, I want to be a full-time minister like this family to share the love of God. And thereafter, for a few good events, affirmation, uh, I went to Bible college and became a pastor and has been pastors for the last 21 years.
What happens is you, you, you come to these countries, you know, Western missions is we're, we're bringing uh, not just Jesus, but we're bringing our concepts, our doctrines, and our culture to the whole world. And we're expecting them to just take it at face value. So what would happen if you boil it down to just Jesus and the Spirit and you let the Lord show you what would happen culturally in a different way in a different country? Now, I heard a story about you, though. Okay. Now we start to, to tell you? Uh -huh. Okay. I heard a story about you. In positive way or negative way? Um, <laughs> not sure. <laughs> uh, Ajahn told me this about you. Uh -huh. He said, uh, you know who Smith is? And uh -huh. I said, um, yeah, he, <laughs> he works with uh, Peter. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. No, do, do you know what he did uh, when he was younger? Uh -huh. And I said, no. He said, well, he, um, he didn't want to have anything to do with Christianity. Absolutely not. Not wanted to do anything with Christianity. In fact, someone gave him a Bible, uh -huh. and he used the pages of the Bible as bathroom tissue. Uh -huh. Now, I had been told that story. He had told me that story. But I did not know that it was you that that story was about. <laughs> I love that story. It's true that it what is. you said. Yes, it is true. I don't think that is true. It's, 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 it, tr it, it can be true. It can be can only Jesus Christ come to the world and then God die on the crosses and then our sin will get away. No way. Right. When you do sin, sin should be there, and then you have to pay for the sin. You understand every single word that I try. Okay, now. I open my heart, your Holy Spirit come into my heart. <laughs> Suddenly, I feel happiness. I feel that. Really? Something has been moved in my heart and that room. Hey. Um, I want you to, uh, uh, Anthony got me, uh, got me distracted by a, uh, big golden Buddha out in the middle of a field. Um, you don't see that in Nashville every day. Um, hey, I want you to get your rest and, uh, and get well and, uh, try, try, try to do what the doctors and Sandra say. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hey. Let me let you say hi to Surapal. Okay. Hold this. It's okay. Hello, สวัสดีครับอาจารย์เคนเฮ้ยสวัสดีครับเป็นยังไงครับยังจำภาษาไทยได้อยู่นะนานนานมาอีกพบนะครับก็ดีใจมากเลยที่ได้พบอาจารย์นอแมนแล้วก็เพื่อนของเขาทั้งสองคนที่มาเยี่ยมเราก็มีโอกาสได้คุยกันถึงเรื่องงานที่อาจารย์ได้ทําไว้เราก็ขอบคุณพระเจ้ามาก Well I am really proud of your work when I was there last time I mean you have just done a very marvelous job and I want to thank you for it Yes, yes, I'm really thankful to God and uh, I'm really thank you because of you, because of your uh, encouragement and uh, your support that we are able to do what we are doing now. The place where we are right now is it's, uh, it's called, the village is called Ban Kutau, which is about three kilometers to the uh, Cheng San Tao, which is the Uh, the border of between Thai and Laos and it's divided by the Great Mekong River. Around the year, I think 2000, uh, Ajahn Ken and his uh, <coughs> Lahu co-pastor came up here and they uh, had a call from God to start the uh, Bible training center. So out of that, uh, <coughs> that uh, vision, 
So they have uh, started the ministry here. Uh, it has been called the uh, Good News for Life uh, Bible Training Center. And uh, together with his, uh, his Lahu co-worker, they started to train uh, young people, mainly from the Lahu tribe. Could you tell me about the loss of Ken's grandson, Matthew? Mm. Oh. Well, Matthew was out with his older brother and some friends. They decided to go over to an area close to the university where a lot of the students went, the noodle shops and you know places to eat. And they ate there. Uh, they had all uh, gone down and, you know, were jumping in vehicles and it turned out there was not enough room in the cars. So Micah and Matthew decided to ride their motorcycles. And even though Matthew was pretty strict about wearing his helmet, he just, he didn't have it. So he didn't go back upstairs to get it when the dis split second decision was made. On the way back, they were all at an intersection headed back toward Payak University, and it was like 11.30 at night or something. And uh, as they took off from this intersection, Matthew peeled off and went to the right, and everybody else went straight. And not more than 100 year, yards past that intersection is where he was killed. Something caused him to cross those two lanes of traffic and hit a tree. I mean, it just didn't really make much sense. They had him in surgery couldn't save him. Norman called and uh, told us what had happened. We were on a plane by the next morning. It was just a really, really horrible time for the whole family. Was, uh, couldn't believe he was gone. So we went back for the funeral. And here's the casket out there. And all the people around. So what's, how's he praying? He's praying for the boy to, raise, to be raised. I'm standing there in unbelief. What are you doing, man? I'm embarrassed, you know. Hey, he's praying for the resurrection of that body right there. And uh, I said that to help us understand that the only truth that you have in speaking to any person, especially those outside of the Christian orientation, 
is the truth of the Spirit. And when Jesus sent them out, the only thing He promised them, that I will give you the Holy Spirit of truth, and He will bear witness to me. He would teach you all things, literally. He'll bring to your remembrance everything that I've taught, literally. Now, I may not know all the parables, but the lessons that he taught in those parables, he brings to your mind when that time is there. How's he feeling? Good. Yeah, let me say hi to him. Hi, bud. <laughs> hey, hey, the doctor just came in. Well, you tell the, okay. You better do whatever the doctor says. Yeah, I'll be there in a few days. Spending time in Singapore was something I never expected to hit me the way it did. The people of Boscombe saw Ken in a different way than I had ever seen. Love loosed my chains, and in you I'm free. But Jesus, why me? And Jesus said, Come to the waters, send by my side. I know you are thirsty, you won't be denied. I felt every tear drop when in darkness you cried, and I strove to I remember when they were just a handful, and I'd try to get you to sing these songs, and you'd sing them, but they'd be flat, they'd be sharp, but tonight, it's beautiful, really beautiful. Of all the churches I know and where I've been, the people that I know, to me, you are the most lovely, giving, just absolutely sweet, thoughtful, kind, caring people that I know of. great battle, but you have weathered the storm. I'm very proud of you guys. To the day you die, you'll never hear anything more beautiful than God. God loves you. It's forgiving. It's merciful. It's kind. 
it's uh, bleeds. It'll hold your hand. You'll be there in your dearest thoughts. And no matter what your needs are, his heart and sympathy is with you. In the deep valleys, he's there with you. And he'll bring you to higher, higher loftier places. He's there with you. If you fall, he's there to pick you up. This is the message of God. He has the same heart for everybody in the world. We're going to be leaving here in a minute. Mm. I want to ask you a favor. Will you pray for me? You bet. Sweet rivers of redeeming love lie just before mine eyes. Had I the opinions of a dove, I to those rivers rise. I'd rise superior to my pain with joy outstrip the wind and cross old Jordan stormy main and leave this world behind During the making of this documentary I got to meet so many people who had such a deeper relationship with Ken than I could have ever imagined. Some of these people have been walking with him for decades. Sometimes I felt like an imposter sitting and talking with people who had walked through some of the most difficult times of their life with Ken there to guide them. And yet, I found this thread, this common thread in all of us, that we would sit at his feet, listen to his teachings and his jokes, and we would find the best example of love that we had ever seen. I can't even imagine how many people have been affected by this man who has reached out to so many thousands of people. And I guess that's why I wanted to introduce him to you. What I worry about is bringing the person that I'm talking to to what is understood as eternal life. The life of God reigning in you now, which is full of love and compassion, pity and mercy and hope. You have a reason for living and you have a reason for dying. He's interested in the now, not in yesterday, not in tomorrow but how we live and think and feel towards him now, because the now is all we got.
I'm gonna land on that shore I'm gonna 